we we are on the finishing line or close to finishing line i'll show you today we discussed with you two days ago diagonalization uh today will be a short lecture i'll show you the main application of this diagonalization you're going to use you, you're going to see in the yellow book uh then we'll, i say main but uh, there might be some extra next week. I'm not sure exactly what it, I mean. Like I, I'm not sure what exactly what's what. Uh, I'm not sure about the material that we're going to discuss next week. 100%. There might be some extra applications, but the main application of diagonalization and by implication the uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors in this topic in the yellow book. It's the it's a computation of matrix powers. It's a very simple idea, but it goes. Quite a long way to like a, you can you can do lots of things with this with this idea. So normally when you present this idea, we just I'll, I'll present this idea in a general setting of square matrix of size n times n. So imagine we have diagonalized that matrix. So we have found two matrices P and G such that P is invertible. So we have full diagonalization. G is a diagonal with eigenvalues on, on the diagonal, and that's the diagonalization relation. So imagine we have accomplished a, diag a diagonalization on a matrix. I'll show you how this helps in computing powers of this matrix. In general, the idea goes like this. So if you, if you after a, k a, k a kth power of a matrix A, which is k is an integer, or in fact, k is a positive integer in this setting right now. Uh, that's right. If you're after such a power, which is by definition, so when you multiply a by itself k times, when you multiply a by itself k times, heavy matrix diagonalized will stream will will make this computation feasible, as a matter of fact, because if k is say like a, a hundred or a thousand. It's no way you can do it a thousand times. I mean, like a directly with just the entries of the matrix. But with diagonalization, you can do something like this. You can say, all right, uh, in this representation, in this big product, I will replace every factor with my diagonalization relation. Is a replacement. Look at this. All of the A factors I replace with the diagonalization relation here from here. Now, if you just rearrange your brackets differently, if you now just say, rather than putting the brackets around the, this triple of factors, I'll put them around the adjacent P and P inverse, like this. So PG, the first PG, I just leave it as it is. Then the next couple of P inverse and P, I couple them together. G in here. Then the next couple of P inverse and P, I couple it together. I do it all the way until this last couple of P inverse in P, which is here. It's the last couple of such P inverse in P. And the remaining two factors, G and P inverse, here they are. And just a rearrangement of brackets. Now, within every, within, within every couple here, because P and P inverse together, when you multiply them, you expect only one result. You expect identity. My expression becomes like this, PG, I just copy from here. Identity for this factor, for this bracket, G. Then another identity of size N, obviously, because everything is happening in, in N times N matrices space. Uh, I N for the bracket in here, and that's the last expression. Right. So if you analyze this, if you, if you analyze what's happening, all of these inner brackets of P inverse and P, they basically disappeared. They went into the identity, which you can just disregard altogether. Now you need to realize how many Ds you ended up with in here. But that's, that's easy because one D comes for every one A. Originally you had K A, so you will have K Ds. So you will end up with a product like this. Everything inside ends up to be just Ds repeated K times. And that's another way to say that we're looking at power of D this time. So it's another way to say that we're looking at the expression like this, P, D to the power K, P inverse. That's the main idea of about the computing of powers of a matrix, which has 
diagonalization relation. Not everyone does. We, I saw, we, we saw one example two days ago when the matrix didn't have a full diagonalization. We had a semi-diagonalization, but we didn't have a full diagonalization. But on many occasions, matrices do have diagonalization relation. In that case, finding the power of the matrix will be as easy as, for, as computing this expression. If you just if you if you estimate the difficulty of computation by the number of times you need to do matrix multiplication, this is a lot simpler than this. Because here you need to do how many multiplications you, here we need to do? Matrix multiplications. K take one, isn't it? I mean for every cross. It's one single matrix multiplication. Altogether, we have k take one crosses because we have k factors. Here, you have only two matrix multiplications to perform, one of them between g, k, and p, and the other one is here between g, k, and p. The power of the diagonal matrix, it's something we discovered with you a few weeks ago, or maybe a week ago, 10 days ago. For the diagonal matrices, powers, Computation of powers doesn't represent any difficulty. It's just you have to take to the power every diagonal entry, numerical power, every diagonal entry. So all the difficulty about powers of the matrix is just disappeared altogether because all we need to do is just to find this number and just do two matrix multiplications. Like it or not, this is a main one of the main drivers for the importance of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And diagonalization relation, which is just the implication of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. You will, you will most likely appreciate this even more when you will learn the more advanced method, how to take two powers matrices which do not have diagonalization relations. You will appreciate the simplicity of this argument a lot more when you learn that more advanced argument. It won't, it won't happen in this course. Those of you who will continue Spectral analysis, uh, you will you will see that it's a sec it's a second level it's a second year topic uh, in in a few courses we teach this in the on second level uh, but when you have diagonalization this is as easy as this uh, that, that's right well you can do actually you can move it even further a little bit further I mean here you see I just emphasize that we're looking at the positive powers you can come up with a similar relation for the negative powers, subject to some conditions to be met, subject to some conditions to be met. So the first thing you can you can observe is that inverse for the matrix, I, I put a question mark here because this requires a proof, but I claim, I claim that the inverse in fact of a matrix will have a similar relation, similar to this, similar to the diagonalization relation. Look at this. The same factors, P, P inverse, but inside I replace D with the G inverse. Very much in line with this idea. It is just this identity requires a separate proof because this, the, the argument which I presented here, it works only for positive case. It doesn't work for negative one, it doesn't. So you cannot just refer to this as a, as a, as a justification for this claim. This claim requires a separate argument. Because this, this argument works only for positive case. That's, that's how you define powers when k is a positive integer. Now, the separate argument for this identity, that's why I put the question mark here once again, it just, you just do it by definition. You just, you just, you just test. So if, you, if I claim that this is the inverse to A, all I need to do, I need to take the product like this, and I need to show you that this will be identity. I mean, I need to take the product like this. This is a replacement for A. This is a replacement, or this is a uh, conjectured value for A inverse. If I, if I convince you that this product is identity matrix, that will be the argument or enough evidence to show that this bracket is exactly the inverse to this bracket or exactly the inverse to A. That's, that's how it is on the conceptual level. On the technical level, it, it, it follows the same idea. You just rearrange the brackets in this expression. Yeah, that's the rearrangement. You put the this p inverse and this p together, which will bring it, which will just make it one. One cancels the other. Here it is. Now this identity disappears. Now you couple this d with this d inverse. 
and that is another identity, G times G inverse, it's an identity. And then you, you couple P with the P inverse once last time, and you end up with just one single identity. And that's the end of the proof that this is, this is indeed true. So now I can kill this question mark. And that's the formula which can help you to find the inverse for the matrix. Again, given that you know diagonalization. Well, there's all, I did all of that, but uh, in my work, I just didn't actually make a one single, I didn't make a comment when exactly you can do something like this because, yeah, uh, this the inverse, again, for the diagonal matrices, it's something we discussed with you two weeks ago, or 10 days ago, I don't remember exactly. Well, with the diagonal matrices, finding the inverse, it's an easy task. You just invert every diagonal entry. For the diagonal matrices, arithmetic is very simple. It's just basically numerical arithmetic. But here's a, here's a condition which is attached to this identity. The condition must be that the diagonal entries of your original D, well, original D was a bit high on my slide, but anyway. Uh, diagonal entries on my in my original D, they must be non zero otherwise you won't be able to invert them, and that means that you don't have an inverse. So it, here's the condition. The inverse exists if and only if every diagonal entry is non zero. And it, and this works either way. I mean if every diagonal entry is non zero, you can recover inverse via this formula. If there is a vector, if there is a value which is zero on a diagonal, meaning that you have an eigenvalue which is zero, it means that your null space of your matrix is non-empty, sorry, non-trivial, and your matrix is not invertible. So this works, this condition works either way. Yeah. And now after you after you have established this relation. You can do the negative powers, any negative powers, in fact. Because now you can say, if, I, if, I, if I'm about to compute the negative power of my A, K is positive here, so it's negative K, I can make this transformation. And that becomes a positive power, but over different matrix, over matrix negative one. Oh, so over the matrix A negative one. For this new matrix, for this new matrix, we in fact do have diagonalization relation. This is the relation, which for this new matrix works exactly as the original one for A. That's the beauty of it, actually. Uh, if you know, if you know diagonalization relation for the original A matrix, like in here, this one, it works like diagonalization relation for the AK matrix. This one works as a diagonalization relation for the A negative 1 matrix. You don't have to recompute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors here. In fact, the, the, the relation itself suggests that for this matrix, the eigenvalues will be the inverses of the eigenvalues of A. For this matrix, the eigenvalues will be the k powers of the eigenvalues of the of A. It's again just it's what this idea that diagonalization relation, it's a one single way to, to just give you every information about eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix. So if you want to see how to compute the negative powers of A, all you do you just go into here. You observe that for the A inverse you do have a diagonalization relation like this. And you can repeat this idea now. That's what I do here by, uh, by putting dots. So you just repeat the same steps, except that you use A inverse rather than A and G inverse rather than G in here. And you end up with this. So that's the way to compute the negative powers of your A. But this is, of course, subject to this, subject to the fact or subject to the uh, requirement that eigenvalues are non-zero. Okay, any questions? Like I said, this is a main example or main application of eigenvalues and eigenvectors and diagonalization in the yellow book you're gonna be working on. 
I'll show you a few examples. Again, to save some time, I will use the pre-computations we've done in a few lectures before today. I mean, I will use those examples for which we have already computed the eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and diagonalization elements, D and P matrix. And I use those examples, and I'll just show you the formulae for, for the powers of those matrices. Any questions in relation to this general idea? Like I said, when, when, when for the matrices which do not have a diagonalization, the things becomes a lot harder. And there are many matrices which do not have diagonalization, for which we need to compute the powers. Okay, first example, it's the two times two matrix, the one, no, it's not here. Given that we, given that the, all of the heavy computations, we, we've done it already in, my, in, in the previous lectures, it's all about the idea, like just all about the just one single idea. I mean, you don't have to do work hard to do it. So that's the matrix for which for which we that's the matrix for which we have found eigenvalues and eigenvectors. That's the one which I showed you two days ago, and that's the one which we have computed like a lecture 18 or 19. I don't remember right now. For this matrix, two days ago we found elements of diagonalization. We found the P matrix and D matrix. Here they are. This is the this is the data we we found two days ago. So for this matrix A, we do have such a relation with this D and with this P. Also two days ago we have computed the inverse of this P. That was the inverse from two days ago. Now I can present a formula which will compute every possible power of my A matrix. All I need to do, I need to do this. All I need to do, I need to compute this right hand side. And this time I can say that this works for any K, positive or negative, because the condition of invertibility is satisfied here. You see, negative six and three are non-zero eigenvalues, each of them. So hence I can claim this identity for any K, positive or negative, and zero by the way as well. Again, you cannot prove it for zero, you just make the observation, but when k is zero, this d becomes identity matrix, and then this p and p negative one, they couple together into identity. And you have identity here by definition. Anyway, so here's my computation. So here's power ak. It's a p matrix, right from here. It's a power of d, you see? When you, when you take d, to kth power, or you do you take the diagonal entries to that k power. And then goes p inverse. So like I said, all you need to do, you need to do two matrix multiplications. It's getting even better, as a matter of fact, because one of these multiplications involves diagonal factor, isn't it? Either this one, whichever you do first, with matrix multiplications, associative multiplication, so it doesn't matter which one you do first, left cross or right cross, but whichever you do first, one of the factors in your first multiplication will be diagonal one. And when you multiply something by a diagonal factor, it's again, it's an it's a easy multiplication, it's a, very easy to do. If, if I do this cross first, yes, that's the cross I do first in my pre-computed slide, all I need to do, I need to take diagonal entries and multiply columns by that di by those diagonal entries. That's how you multiply a matrix by a diagonal factor. So here it is. One and nine, this scalar, I just put it up, up in front, is the what I said, I multiply each, I scaled every co column here with the corresponding entry on the diagonal, one, two. This is still copied, this bit. I still copy. Only one cross, which is a true hard matrix multiplication you need to do, where you need to do the fully fledged matrix multiplication algorithm. So here it is. It's one and nine. And so this row with this column, given we have a zero here, just, it's a, just you see, three K, I converted this nine into three square, and that's why it's three K plus two. Now this 
uh, row and this column, it will be a lengthy one, isn't it? It's a negative five, negative, so it's a whole thing from here times one, and then, and then this 3k times five right here. This is zero because this row and this column, they're perpendicular to each other. Zero and zero, they just make it zero. And the last one is this row and this column. It's just one, it's just this term because of the zero again. That's the one. This is a formula, general formula, which works for any integer, and that will give you the value for the power of the matrix A for any integer. Yeah. Even if right now you don't know why actually like a power is so interesting in the in the in applications, even if you don't know that, you can't deny this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. You you hardly can do something like this without eigenvalues and eigenvectors, without diagonalization identity. Predicting such a formula for any k. In fact, I show you where this actually what what sort of thing you can do with these powers now when you know when you know the direct formula for powers, it's like basically you can just predict the dynamics of dynamic systems. It's which and we're sort of gonna go back to one of the topics we discussed with you at the very beginning of, 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 of this course. Remember this discrete time dynamic systems, continuous time dynamic systems? That's that's where it comes back and helps you. Uh, but just from the point of view of finding such a power, just from the point of view of solving this task without eigenvalues and eigenvectors, it's it's hardly imaginable how you can possibly do that without diagonalization relation. Any questions? Again, that's, um, it, it, this presentation is so short and neat because uh, we, we, the, heavy, the heavy part, the computational part, was we, we've done it before. If you do such, such something like this from the scratch, it will be more lines, more slides, because you need to find eigenvalues, eigenvectors, diagonalization relation, inverse for P, all of these steps, they, they intensive steps. They require discipline and accuracy. But they are all doable. If, for instance, k was like a thousand, there's no any other way to find a to a power of thousand except this way. There's something else on my slide. Ah, well, there's something else on my slide. It's just that I, I also use this identity to find the inverse to my a. All I did, I just replaced this k with negative one. If you replace this k with negative one, that will deliver the formula for the inverse. One and nine, negative one here is three, negative one here it's a negative uh, five and six, negative one here five and three, zero, negative one here it's nine and six or three and two, or negative. Interesting thing on this slide, actually, I just realized. Uh, my original matrix was something which I sometimes call upper triangular, isn't it? I mean, everything non -zero, every non-zero entry is above the diagonal. Be below the diagonal, we don't have anything of substance, just zeros. Well, just only one zero, but actually, it's still upper triangular matrix. If you look carefully for our results, if you look carefully for our, you will see that the, all of the powers of my A also upper triangular, see? The inverse is also upper triangular. That begs the question, is it a coincidence? Or is it interest or is it like a it's a it's a quite expectable and some something something behind it which drives all of the upper triangular matrices when you compute powers inverses of those stay upper triangular? The answer is yes, it's true actually. Upper triangular matrices, when you go for the inverses and powers, they will always be upper triangular no matter which size of the matrix is, it's two times two or three times three. Yeah. Another thing actually, which I realized I wanted to comment on my previous slide, but I forgot, but I'll, I'll do it now. Any questions in relation to this? Uh, in my previous slide, when I argued this formula, when I argued this formula for the power of A, or when I argued the formula for the inverse, I'll open it uh, for, for briefly. When I argued all of these results, I did uh, rather lengthy manipulations with matrices, you know, rearranging brackets and things. And every 
every single step was an easy one, nice, quite respectable one. There will be questions in the yellow book where you, where, where you will need to do something like this. The comment I would like to make is this. I mean, I did quite, quite, quite substantial transformations of my, of, of my expressions on this slide, but I never changed the order of factors in my, in my transformations, you see? I mean, I changed the order of brackets. Yes, I did, but factors, the actual letters, they always kept the order unchanged. You see, it was PDP inverse, PDP inverse. The same order of letters is present here. All the time, I never let, my, I never actually change the order of the factors, and that is, that is a reflection of the fact that you're not allowed to do that with the matrices. The matrix multiplication is non-commutative. You cannot just say A B equal B A freely. Sometimes it does, but it's it's, it's a special cases. So when you do some something like this, when you do questions in the yellow book, tests or exams, please observe this observe this rule as well. You're not allowed to change the order of factors. You're allowed to change the order of brackets. This is the associative law of multiplication, but factors they must keep the same order all the time, unless you can you have evidence for commutativity. Okay, any questions? And the second example I have about the matrix powers, again, I will build this example on pre-computed data from two days ago. We had, two days ago, we had three examples where I attempted diagonalization. In two examples, we had full diagonalization. In one example, we had only semi-diagonalization. So in, the, in these first two examples when we, where we had full diagonalization, I can do matrix powers. And that's the second example from two days ago where we had full diagonalization. It was a, it was a projection matrix. For this matrix, we found diagonalization relation. And the components of that relation were like this. That was P, that's D. Yeah, that's right. That was P and D. Okay, so I can I can attempt finding powers here as well. This time, when I go after powers, I won't be able to go negative powers. You see, we have zeros on the diagonal here. So D, my D matrix doesn't have an inverse, and by implication, A doesn't have inverse as well. So only positive powers are we can be found here. So let's just try to do that. If I do my positive powers, that's the formula. That's the formula for the powers. And if you now attempt to find d power k, look at the d. d power k is d. Right? If you if you if you take to the kth power every diagonal entry here, well, nothing will change, right? One to the power k is one, zero to the power k is also zero. Hence. Hence, the whole thing is just A, isn't it? Kth, in this case, if you compute the kth power of the matrix A, that will be just A, something by quite unusual. I mean, in numbers, this never happens unless, unless A, of course, either 1 or 0. I mean, if you, if you solve an equation like this, in numbers, there will be only two solutions, 0 and 1. Our negative one also can be a solution if k is negative. So if k is odd, sorry. In matrix case, there are apparently there are different there are other solutions. For instance, this is a solution to that as well. Yeah, this is this is for positive case. So well on my slide here I have the p inverse for this p. I mean, because two days ago we made the effort and we computed this p inverse as well. I will, I will open it, but you don't have to copy this. It's just something we, we computed two days ago. Uh, I don't know why I put this on the slide. I just I can't remember right now because for these computations, the actual value of p inverse is is irrelevant. For these computations, the actual value of p inverse is irrelevant. And like I said before, a inverse doesn't exist, and hence none of the negative powers also 
do uh, neither of the negative powers exist also. Any questions? I'll show you one example where actually powers of the metrics they, they, they use. It's that that's when you try to predict the behavior of dynamic system. Uh, I have one example. Again, I just artificially made an example in a way to avoid computational complexities. So my example will rest on my first example today, this example for two times two metrics. Look at this. Is a discrete time systems, so that's the setting of the of the of the system. Imagine you have two sequences. Norm, I mean, like a, it's, it's often, it's often um, what we do often is just like when we denote sequences, we use indexes to indicate dependence on k. But this time, somehow, I just use brackets, which is which is fine. So k is integer. I will just say k is positive integer, right? Uh, and let's just, let's just assume that these sequences, they, they bound by the following recurrence relation. They, you, can, you, can think of, you can think of multiple stories behind this recurrence relation. You can say, for instance, I don't know, let's just say YK will be the population of rabbits. And Oh, okay, okay. But YK will be population of wolves in the, in the forest. XK will be population of rabbits in that forest. By experiments, we established that the wolves decay because the, well, or the wolves are hunted down with a rate 60% a year. Is it decaying with the 60% a year? But the rabbits, well, probably my story is a bit dodgy, isn't it? Because, because like a rabbit's... They can't grow with the population of wolves. They should be like they should be like in the opposite opposite relation, isn't it? All right, but you, I hope you got the idea. You can you can think of multiple stories which will which will justify a recurrence relation like this. If you don't like biological backgrounds like of rabbits and wolves, you can think of monies, uh, interest rates, whatever. You will you'll see lots of. I mean. Given that many of you here, or most of you here from the finance, in your, your, in your degrees, they will make up lots of these fake stories where you will come up with the, with the relations like this. From my point of view, or from the point of view of this, you're still laughing at the wolves and red rabbits? Good, good. I can, next time I can bring pictures in. Uh, from my point of view, or from point of view of, of analysis, the background story is not so much relevant. What is relevant is the resolution of a system, being able to predict the state of a system in the future. And that's where diagonalizations and powers of matrices comes, come handy. So what you do is this. I mean, so like, let me just finish the system. So for instance, we know that the initial state the system was at this stage. We have 100 rabbits and 100 wolves, or $100 in a bank account and $100 in a super account. You can think of multiple stories here, like I said. Our, re our job is to find the state of a system, say, in 100 years. So what you do here is this. You just introduce vectors. So you introduce the vector quantity, x, which consists of these two scalar quantities. You make the observation that my system is governed by the following vector relation. The state of my the vector state of my system in the next state in the next stage will be the B matrix like this multiplied by the state at the current stage and then you say all right if I and my original state you know, my initial state of a system is this this vector 100 100 Now you say if you want if you want to predict the state of your system in the in the future, you can easily resolve this recurrence relation, isn't it? Xk, the state the state of my system in k years, it will be b times x k take one, which is b square x k take two, 
you can resolve this recurrence relation down to the original one, B power K times the initial state of your system. And here comes the power of the matrix, which we know how to compute now. Well, of course, subject to diagonalization, if B has a diagonalization relation, then basically we know everything now. If B doesn't have the if B doesn't has doesn't have sorry diagonalization relation, then it, it you need you need more advanced method what to do with the powers. And those of you who will continue your study of matrices and analysis, you will find you will learn these methods next year probably. But in this case, like I said, I manufactured this example specifically to take away the complexity of computations. I just make the observation that my B matrix in this case it's one tenth of the A matrix we've done today already. The, the A matrix I've done today, first example I've done today, it's exactly one-tenth. B is one-tenth of that matrix. This is the A matrix we saw today, my first example. It, it, this, is, this is like I just, I did this intentionally to avoid complexities of computation because otherwise we would need to do the complete spectral analysis for this B matrix. And I don't want to, uh, I don't want to waste time on this. So if I use the relay with what if I use what we discovered already before, so this is we had this diagonalization relation for A. That was a P on that slide. That was a P inverse on that slide. That was a D on that slide. If I just divide this relation by 10 left and the right hand side, that will deliver diagonalization relation for B, isn't it? So if I divide this, sorry, yeah. So my, if I divide everything by 10 here, left-hand side and the right-hand side, on the left-hand side will be my B matrix. On the right-hand side, I'll have diagonalization relation for this B matrix. Because if you divide D by 10, it will stay diagonal matrix. I mean, if you divide this D by 10, it will be 6 by 10, 3 by 10, but... It is, a, it's still, it is still diagonal matrix, so I can still use the same idea for the powers. I can still use the same idea for the powers. Yeah. Or you can actually say that the, you can actually, you can make it even shorter. You can say that the kth power of B is the kth power of A divided by the 10 to the negative k power. That's another way to do it, of course, because this, this, the formula for this we also know. We have discovered that formula. So that was the that's the that was the formula for the AK from two slides ago. If I now if I now use I mean if I now convert this into the scalar in the scalar form, I say that XK, look at this. XK, which is the first com ah, it's a vector, sorry, it's a vector form. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, xk, look at this, xk is just the bk power times the x0 vector. If you multiply this ak power by the x0 vector, which is 100, 100, is your 100 factor, and you just add these two together, and you add these two together. That's the result. Now, if you break this into components, because this is a vector form, if you break this into the components, individual x, scalar x, and scalar y, these are the formulae, these are the explicit direct formulae for your, for my or for our dynamic system. X component from here, Y component from here. This is a beauty, I'd say. I mean, like, a, if you look back at what we started from, and we started with a, with a recurrence relation between two quantities, two sequences of quantities, we were able, through the matrix powers, resolve them explicitly into a explicitly given sequences here, one and the other. And that will give you the chance to predict the, the state of your system at any time in the future. Any time in the future. I mean, that's your, that's your original system. Here it is. So that's the original recurrence relations. And this is the resolution. Yeah. 
There will be a few examples in the yellow book where you will need to do something like this. There will be different, like I said, different background stories for the recurrence relations. Your job will be decipher the recurrence relations from the, those stories presented and then solve it through diagonalization. Your matrices will be diagonalizable. Non-diagonalizable, like I said many times, you will see in some other course. Uh, any questions? We're almost finished with the topic. I'll, for the next week, I'll show you a few maybe extra. By the way, the system is like this. And next time, we will talk about the terminology. The system is like this, where the next state depends only on the immediate preceding state, not like the state two years ago or three years ago. There are systems which actually like so as well, uh, but they are more complex. The system like this, when the state of a system depends only on the preceding state, it's called mark of mark of chains. And just a piece of a terminology. Mark of chains, so that's when you when you state of the system next time, it just it depends on the preceding state and that's it. Uh, most of them are solved through powers of matrices, or many, or actually all of them solved through powers of matrices. Uh, next time we will probably look a little bit deeper into this mark of chains and some different variations, but we, that will be probably the last topic we're going to learn in this topic. Uh, we're done today. Thank you very much. I'll see you all next week. Thank you.